Hi, I'm Daniel Kellogg, president of Young Concert Artists, and I'm delighted today to talk to pianist Lise de La Salle, one of our wonderful alumna. Um, hello, Lise, how are you? Hi, Dan. So nice to talk to you. I'm great, thanks. Nice to talk to you. So first I want to find out where are you right now? That's a beautiful garden. Thank you. I am in uh, my home country in France and uh, in Normandy, very close to the sea actually. Okay, wonderful. And yeah. is that where you live? No, I'm a Parisian, so I live in Paris, but that's the house for the, the summer, uh, uh, part of the summer. How long will you be there in this place? Uh, for one week now. Oh, fantastic. Well, that's, yeah. that's wonderful. So in this country, things sort of are shut down. Our quarantine began around mid-March. When did it begin for you in Paris? Uh, the same. same My life was in Germany on March 9th. And official quarantine, or quarantine, I never know how to pronounce it. But anyway, was um, started on, I think, the 14 or 15, something like that. And we had several steps uh, towards, I mean, it was total confinement for two months. Wow. And yeah, and then thing um, started again a little bit on uh, June 11th. And since that, certain things are open. Uh, restaurants are open, but you're supposed to be socially distanced. Some restaurants are really doing it. Some others are just back to normal. Uh, big museums are still not really open. Uh, small museums are open, but there is fewer people than the usual, of course. Shops are open, but there's rules, like you can only be four or five, or depending on the size of the shop, but like maximum 10 people. Um, and for, for me and for all of us musicians and artists, that's the worst because all concert halls and all uh, theaters and um, operas are still very, very closed. So. I know that in some places in Europe, some people are doing concerts with a very small audience. Are you able yeah. to do that yet? Okay. No, okay. No, but I, I have a, a recital, not a recital, but a chamber music festival coming up uh, in August in Germany. So I'm very much looking forward to that and very, very happy to, to go back to, you know, live music. Will that festival be um, indoors or outdoors? It's going to be uh, mostly outdoors. Okay, well that's lovely. And I think you said your last public performance was March 9th? Exactly, in Germany. And when did your performing career start? At what age did you start performing for audiences? Uh, I was around 10. I was young. So since the age of 10, have you ever stopped Concertizing. No, no, that's the craziest thing. It's the longest time I have been um, alive, <laughs> you know, uh, without, I mean, starting at age 10, uh, yeah. without performing, without playing a concert. That's totally insane. Has that been very hard for you? It's been, you know, up and down, up and downs, and but it's been hard. It's been very hard because mostly because we don't really know when this is going to go back to normal if it's ever going to be back to normal which i i deeply hope as many of us but we don't have a an ending date you know which you know when you, for example uh, at the opposite but sometimes touring can be hard be away being away for many weeks can be hard but at least you know, the, the very comforting thought is, you know, in five weeks, in six weeks, I'm back home. And with that, if we would be like in two months, in three months, or even in eight months, uh, we, we have our life back, it would be easier. But now it's like, we don't really know. And there is hope some days, and there is bad news the next day, and there is hope again. And so it, it's very, very challenging for, for the nerves and for emotional well-being 
Um, I'm very sorry. I know it's hard. It's certainly hard for all of the YCA artists that I've talked to. Um, how, how are you? In, in a... Sorry, go ahead. How, how is it for you? How, how do you deal with this huge crisis? Well, you know, I started at YCA last July, so I've only I... been just <laughs> one year. And um, suddenly in the very last quarter of my first year, everything stops and everything changes. I think mostly it's been exciting and an opportunity to get creative and see what we can do with our artists to keep them growing, learning, performing. It's frightening. It's very frightening. Um, but I guess I just mostly take it as a challenge and one day at a time. I'm able to carry on my work because I'm, you know, remote work with a computer. You can do that anywhere. Yeah. And even in my artistic career, I'm a composer, not a performer. So I don't have that same relationship to being on stage. But sure. this, this is terrifying. We don't know the future. We don't know when there's a vaccine. We don't know when, you know, even Americans right now, we don't know when we can travel to other countries. We're having a very rough time. And so other countries, you know, want a bit of distance. Um, with your own life over the last three and a half, four months, um, what have you been up to day to day? Did you take a break from music? Are you learning new repertoire? What has life been like for you? Many things, actually. Uh, the first thing about music was I, I really wanted to keep a connection with music, but also with, with my audience. That was very important to me. So I uh, started pretty much right away uh, what I called uh, confinement life. So once a week, I was on Facebook for one hour and I played and I read some poetry or some beautiful texts from authors that I like and that have been very important to me in my life. So, for example, I, for the first five or six confinement live, I uh, read through some Rilke, the letters to a young poet, because that has been very important in my artistic growing life. So I wanted to share that with my audience. And so basically I was playing between 40 and 45 minutes and talking for, no, actually maybe a half and half, like playing for 35 minutes, talking for a half hour. And it's been challenging because the idea on the paper is beautiful, but as a performing artist, the usual schedule is one or two recital per season that you carry with you through the planet. I mean, on tour, you know, in Europe, in Germany, in, uh, I mean, in all Europe and countries, but gonna, I'm not going to name all of them, but then in America and then in Asia. And suddenly I realized that even if I was playing only, you know, 35 minutes to 40 minutes each week for three months, you do the math and it ends up being an enormous amount of work, you know? Yes. So that, that kept me busy. And then also something that was very, very important to me is, you know, I do music for two reasons. The first is obvious. I love music. I was born with music. I could not possibly live without music. But also because I do believe it's a very strong bound that you can share with people, even people you don't know, but it creates some humanity feeling, you know, and I simply couldn't uh, think that I would lose that connection with people for so long. So also pretty much right away, uh, I uh, started working at Red Cross. So I, three days a week, it was intense because it, it was very emotionally demanding so, and very time consuming uh, because it was from 8 a.m until 2 p.m. and it was not in Paris. I had to go to the headquarter uh, where they had the only open building. So I had to wake up at 6.15 every morning to go there and from 8 to 2, for, so for six hours, I was working uh, doing what they called uh, Red Cross at Home. It was a ded dedicated phone line uh, especially for people in trouble because of COVID-19. It, it was 
for many reasons, it could be just because they were lonely and they needed emotional su support. It could be because they had no more food because the only food where they, the shops where they could go were, were closed. We had a lot of homeless, which was very devastating because the only uh, solutions they had were closed. So they were really literally without any kind of resources. It was family who lost track of their people because, you know, they couldn't see each other and they had no other communication. I mean, it was, it was a very, very, very engaging and rich human experience, but also very, uh, I want to say it gave me a lot, but it was also very demanding. So actually, this confinement time was very intense for me. <laughs> very, very intense. That's amazing. I admire that so much to, to seek out that human contact by volunteer work. Did it work? Do you feel like it helped with the adjustment to no concerts? It gave me something to do, you know, because traveling, uh, playing concerts, meeting people is really what I do all the time. So suddenly being home, and even if I was, my idea was to, as you said, learn new repertoire, I think is what every artist thought first, yeah, like, yeah, hey, good, I have time, I can learn. And I, I, I really couldn't do that. I mean, I, I didn't do it enough. I wanted, I still wanted to do it a bit, but I had no time, which is okay, because I feel more uh, myself and more accomplished by what I did even if it was not directly music related that if I had just practice and practice and practice so for for me it was a, a, a good thing to do and necessary because really I, I I couldn't deal with just being home and practice wow that, that's so unusual I have not heard anybody talk about picking up volunteer work because of uh, this crisis. So how long did the volunteer work last and how long did your Facebook live concerts last? Uh, everything lasted until the beginning of June. Okay. So it was okay. for... Time to take a break at that point? Yeah, three, four months, which is long. Yeah, that's a long time. In, in general, how much of the year are you on the road and how much of the year do you take time off from music? I my if i you know it's very hard to say as you know you know concert uh, are not on a regular schedule but a uh, good month i mean good months for my personal life a good month is when i can be home between a week and 10 days and the rest of it i am on the road wow so this has really just been a complete change in every direction oh, it's been like crazy actually Really? Have you picked up anything new? Have you taken on a new hobby or something you're learning? No, I, I, as I, I just said I, I was very busy. I have not yeah, really no time. Sure. Um, for else. So I know that you've done quite a bit of recording. It, I, I was reading. Is it about nine albums, or is it even more than that? I think it's more. I think by now it should be eleven or twelve. Is that right? That's a lot, and especially at an age where not everybody is recording as much. So you must really like recording. What, what attracts you to recording in the first place? You know, I, um, deep down, I'm a, I'm a perfectionist, but I, long ago, I realized, and the more I'm growing as an artist, the more I realize that live performing, which is my first love and my, I don't want to say true love, but that's what really makes me uh, an artist is live music. Uh, there is no way it can be perfect. And there is no such thing to damage a performance that, for me at least, than to think, oh, I have to be perfect. Because concert is about emotion, is about feelings, is about sharing something with your audience. And a wrong note or something not perfect is part of it. And that's, I think, and I, I, I believe it when I, I teach or when I give master classes, that's a, a very big, in my opinion, a very big uh, mistake that young people are doing. They are very much looking for the perfect, you know, perfect rendition of a piece. And they forget that music is not a science. 
music is an art, is a living thing. And so because I realized that the more I want to give the music something true, the more vulnerable I, I, I become, which I think is what we should all be. An artist is supposed, in my opinion, again, is supposed to be vulnerable. Hmm. But on the other way, when you are in the studio, you have that option to go as far as you want to try to capture that perfection. It's never perfect anyway, but to go as far as you want, as far as you can uh, with your own, you know, as, uh, with your own capacity and uh, what you have in your mind, your, your goal, and you can get as close as possible from it uh, as many times as you want. Even though, again, when I record, I, I always do long tracks. I, I never stop and I, I never do bar by bar, one bar after another, because I think this, this makes no sense for me. But at least I can really try to go as deep as I can into my, to, to go as close as I can from my ideal, you know? So recording and live performance are two very complementary activities. They exactly. are very different parts of your music making. Oh, that's wonderful. Thanks. How does the recording project come about? How long in advance do you plan and think about a recording, prepare the music? What's that like? Um, usually it's about three to six months in advance. We try to set up the dates and the studio and to, because if you want a good cr crew, if you want the, the people you know or the people you, you really want to work with, they're busy. So you know how in advance and ahead we plan in this industry. So it's, uh, it's less than for concert because sometimes we are planning one or two or even three seasons ahead. But even, even though it, it saves, we need at least three to six months. And do you return to the same place to record every time or have you recorded in many different settings? I have recorded in many different places, but uh, some places that I really enjoyed, I, I went back a couple times. And for example, I'm recording uh, just at the end of August, my next album. And uh, I'm very glad because uh, it's a place where I'm gonna go back for the first time. So meaning it will be my second time. Uh, it's a place I, everybody know about. It's uh, the legendary Teldex studio in Berlin. And mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to discover that uh, studio just a year ago when I was recording with Daniel Hope uh, the Chausson poem uh, and it was released on Deutsche Grammophon uh, early this year and so this was an amazing experience I mean musically it was amazing of course playing with Daniel was absolutely I mean it's a it's a dream but also the, the place the studio was like wow this is really this is really why it's it has this kind of legend spirit aura around it because the place in itself is just magical. So when I was planning my new solo rep, my solo uh, recording, uh, I asked my label, can I go there? And they said, yes. So. Well, wonderful. What is yeah. your project? What's on this recording? Um, it's a very cool project. I mean, I, I like it. It's a, uh, it's going to be called Shall We Dance? And um, the, the story behind is I always talking about music and realizing what's important to me is really about movement and movement in music, but also in, in life. You know, if you are stuck somewhere and if you stop moving, basically for, for me, it's, it's death. Like you need to move whatever you do, but do something. So I movement first and then rhythm you know the pulse the the heartbeat for me is really what makes music such an inspiring thing and uh, why sometimes just hearing some music makes you can totally change your 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 spirit you know 
And so I, and also I'm a big dance fan. I used to dance when I was younger and I still dance sometimes and I really, really, really enjoy it. So I was like, okay, let's combine the two. And then after many hours of thinking, I was like, how can I do that? If I want to do all the music and dance story, I'm going to record 10 albums. So I had to make a selection. So I decided to actually concentrate on uh, a period that is absolutely my favorite period in the history of humanity, if I can say, especially for the art, which is basically the end of the 19th century until the end of the 20th century. So basically 1850 until 1950. I, I really adore that century in music, in literature, in paintings, in theater. I think it's just a fascinating period of time. And then this is the only uh, years I'm looking at, but I'm doing a, a world tour, a tour du monde. And so I'm exploring dances in France, in Europe, then I'm going south with uh, what happened in Spain uh, with tango. And uh, uh, in France, it's like Ravel, the no Les Valses Nobles Sentimentales. Then I'm going to the Slavic world with uh, some polka by Rachmaninoff, uh, uh, waltz by Scriabin, a little bit more east with the uh, Romanian folk dance by Bartok. And then I'm ending in America with Gershwin and then crossing a little bit towards jazz with Fat Wallers and with T42 Art Tatum and all those things. So it's a very cool project. I'm excited about it. Wow, is the Art Tatum, is that, did he write pieces down or is that a transcription of one of his performances? It's, uh, he's official, if there is kind of an official version. Okay. But the, the craziest T42, I don't know if you know this, this one specially. Yeah, yeah. The one Art Tatum played and it's, it's crazy. It's, it's really extremely ferociously uh, difficult, but it's, it's amazing. Well, that's great. That sounds like a very eclectic recording. One question I had was how, how is planning for a, an album or a recording different than planning a recital program? I, I do both um, at the same time. I always record what my season program or try to play what I'm going to record because I think they work hand by hand. So when you're playing a program that is so eclectic, that has you know music from Spain and music from Russia, in addition to this Art Tatum and music from America, how do you know when it all fits? Is it just a matter of playing through it and feeling it? That's a risk, but I think it's a risk with all kind of program when you're trying to create something a little different, uh, but that still makes sense. Uh, you, you take a risk and you, you know it's working in theory you know right. and until you play it you you don't have the 100 percent confirmation that it works so it, it's a risk to take but uh gladly it it works both in theory and in the concert hall with the order of this program do you know it already or is that something you will figure out after the recording is complete uh no no the order is uh is quite fixed because okay. i want the way I do it in concerts, meaning starting uh, with the French and all four uh, geography chapter has, they have their own name. So I'm going to start with the French Dutch. Uh, then I'm moving to the um, Slavic soul, then Spanish influences, and then the American dream to end. Fantastic. How long, how many days have you planned in the studio? How long will you spend there? I usually all, always have three days. That's my usual. Um, it's not too long. It's not too short. It's, uh, you know, because uh, for me to have time to do a good uh, sound check and to know exactly what kind of sound I want and to have it, uh, it takes half a day almost, uh, at least three or four hours, you know, because this is very important. That's not something I want I know that after you can always adjust, you know, level up, level down, more echo, less, more room whatsoever. 
more reverb, less reverb, you can basically change it all. But I don't really like to do that because I, I, I want the, the recording to be as honest and as true as possible. So that's something I, I give a lot of time during my session. Well, that's great. I look forward to, to hearing that. I'm so glad that you were able to do that in August. Uh, yeah, me too. It was planned to, to happen during the, the confinement. I, I was supposed to record in April, so uh, I'm glad it was postponed not too far. Oh, that's great. So let me shift gears. And what year did you join the YCA roster? So, you know, just before talking to you, I was thinking maybe I should try to remember that. <laughs> so I think, if I am correct, that it was in 2004. That's what I looked up, and I think that's correct, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was just 16, and I remember I had a special derogation uh, because I was a year too young. I, I think the official uh, earlier age you were allowed to to be a candidate was 17 so and was your career already going quite strongly in europe at that time it was the beginning but yeah i had some gigs here and there yes and so it's probably been quite a while since you took an audition or went to a competition what is it like to to go to something like the yca auditions i remember it very well actually and it was the last audition i uh, i mean competition i i i took so it was my first uh time in the us it was my first time being in new york so i was so excited i was like living a dream and it was in january uh and i think i mean it was during the winter and it was so cold so very cold that after the first round i got super sick like very sick and during the two days in between the rounds i was just in bed and shaking and have a, having high fever so i couldn't practice my second round at all and so i played the second round with no not much hope because you know i was like Pah. anyway i couldn't really prepare of course you have to be ready before but you know what i mean mm -hmm. And so somehow I think it took a little bit of the pressure off because I, I had no, not much hope or expectation. I was just, okay, I'm going to play and we'll see. And then, then the result came and it was such a, such a dream, you know, especially because I, I knew it, it was the, the beginning of, you know, my career in America and time chances for me to, to spend some time there and to travel the country. So it was, it was a big, big experience. Well, that's wonderful. Did you get to see any of New York on that first trip? Before I got sick, yes. <laughs> and what was your impression? I mean, did you grow up in Paris itself? Yes. So what was your impression of New York? It's a very different city. Yeah, and you know, um, I just adored it. Uh, it was, it was exactly the way I imagine it, it was crazy, it was full of life and full of energy and, you know, kind of the feeling of uh, the famous city that never sleeps. And I, I really, really, really enjoyed it. Well, that's wonderful. Um, thinking back to your time on the roster, you know, we are about to celebrate our 60th anniversary in this next season. And uh, I was wondering if you have any fun stories you could share from your time on the roster. I had many uh, great moments. Uh, I don't recall anything specific right now, but um, I remember my first gig uh, after I won the audition was in one of the most beautiful places ever uh, in Cape Cod. And so that was absolutely perfect. I remember the first time I came back after the audition to perform my first tour, I ended up the first evening looking at the sea and eating great lobster and i was like okay this is a good start i think i'm gonna like it here <laughs> and uh, i also gave my first master class because in, in america that's a wonderful thing that you you always not always but very often link um concerts with master classes to a university 
and I was way younger than most of the people who played for me so that was uh that was very special but i got a lot of encouragement from the presenters and so that was a very important moment too because i i love to teach and i've been doing it as much as i can since then and the first time happened in the us so that was a very important thing for me also and learning to the language you know because i spoke some english but not very much uh, so i really learned by going on tour and being being there and so i i made some funny mistake of course and and always had support from the people around so it was it was really cool and of course the there's the people working at yca all the team uh it was like a big family really well that's wonderful so you started, I read that you started playing piano at age four, is that right? That's correct. How did you come to play the piano? We had a piano at home and uh, my family, I'm, I'm the first professional, I mean, uh, con concert player, mm -hmm. performing artist, or I never know exactly what is my official title, but anyway, my, my mother uh, used to sing in a choir and my grandma was a piano teacher. So um, music was always part of my life, my, you know, even before I was born. So nothing more than that, just being around music, listening to music all the time, having a piano at home, I started and I guess, I, I know I asked for more and then my mom decided to give me, to have someone, a teacher give me piano lessons. So that's how I started. Was there a moment when you knew this is what you wanted to do with the rest of your life? Not really, uh, or ever. I don't know. I, I, there was no uh, real this uh, important moment where I, I was like, oh, now I know. I always knew. I always wanted to do that. So it was just a long road, a long path, you know, through being a very young kid to being a... Uh, eight, nine years old and to go through my teenage years and this, this conviction, this big thing in me never stopped telling me that was what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be. So I feel very fortunate. I never questioned it. Even when I was, you know, fed up because let's face it, some days you don't want to practice, you know, but I, I never questioned that it was what I wanted to do. I also read that you stopped um, sort of formal piano lessons around the age of 18. That's true. Yeah, so that means that many times, uh, you know, professional musicians, they do college, graduate school, summer festivals, they keep having lessons well into their 20s. Was that intentional or was that by accident that you stopped at 18? Actually, it was not planned. I just needed a break from any kind of lesson I had at the time. And uh, I, and even now, I know that if I meet someone, not a teacher, but if I meet someone, a pianist, and I have the opportunity to play for him or her, I, I will do it. It's not a question of, of age, but what I notice and what is very important is like, you don't need a teacher to learn. I'm learning every day from old recordings, from old master, from books I read, from videos on YouTube I'm watching, from colleagues, other musicians I'm performing with, with by, uh, from conductors, uh, from you know anyone that has uh, an interesting uh, point of view or do or play great music I'm always learning so it's a different type of learning but there is no stop stopping I don't think there is well that leads me to my next question which is um, you know you joined the roster at age 16 and many people join between 16 and let's say 22 and the point of young concert artists is to really help extraordinary people like yourself at the beginning of your career 
and your career has gone very well. You're recording, concertizing, playing with major orchestras. When you look back on your life, you know, as, since your teenage years, how have you changed as an artist? How has life changed as you've settled into a very active performing career? You know, I don't see a big change. I see evolution, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, don't, I don't see a different person. I don't see a different anima. I don't see many things differently. I, I feel very fortunate because I'm still totally uh, amazed by what I do. Uh, not, uh, you understand what I mean. Not, <laughs> not yeah. what I do by the quality but just the luck I have to do what I do to be able to play all over the world and to perform and to record as you mentioned I I still feel like it's almost Christmas every day you know I still look at music and feel music and play music with the same uh, amazed feeling and love and emotion and I'm still uh, very much in love with uh, being on stage and sharing that with with an audience and I you know traveling is sometimes is getting old a little bit but I haven't I, I, I'm surprised to say that I miss it now you know even the traveling part of it being four months with no fl flights is like what is happening so um, no, I, I have to admit that this is kind of a dream life for me. And I don't want to say that it's all easy and all pink and all perfect. It, you know, you have a lot of sacrifices to do. You have a lot of um, things that are not totally ideal that you have to cope with. But because the result is being on stage and sharing the music with the people, it, it, it feels normal and the right thing to do so i i don't suffer from any big uh you know m i don't miss important stuff in my life and also i have to say i've been very lucky to always have great people around like my managers uh you know right from the beginning and in the u.s it started with yca and then uh, when I moved to the agency I'm still with now in the U.S., which is Frank Salomon Associates, those people always, I mean, YCA first and FSA now, and my managers in, in Europe, these people always have been very, very protective and very understanding of my needs. And I always said very clearly, I need some time off to be home, you know, because I know how easily you can be playing every other day and never being home and your life becomes really only flights hotels concert halls and you lose time for family friends and time for yourself when by the way you are learning new repertoire and growing as an artist and it goes back to what i said first uh, i think music is about art and about life and if you want to say something through your music you need to have something to say. And if your life is empty, you have nothing to say. So, you know, you have to feed yourself. What advice would you give to young artists who are just beginning a solo career or a chamber music career, young YCA artists? What, what I said earlier, like, don't forget that music is, uh, a, is something about life. It's something about emotion. It's, it's something that is meant to touch people. It's not about being as fast as possible or as perfect. Of course, if you can play all the right notes, it's better. But the, it's not the, for me, it's not the priority. The priority is to make music, meaning to create some kind of emotion in the people you're playing for. And to create an emotion in someone in front of you, you have to first feel it yourself, you know? And uh, it's like, in my opinion, it's hard to, cook a great dinner if you don't like what you cook and if you don't have the taste in your mouth and in your brain you know first I, I love food too I, I guess I'm French so but <laughs> but you know what I mean so love the music you do feel it and then share it and the obsession of perfection is 
is a good guidance, but it's not. It should not uh, be the only thing, really. Well, that that leads me to another question about choosing repertoire. Earlier, you said that you typically will take two programs and spend the whole season taking those programs around the world. So, if you pick a piece, you're going to play it many, many, many times. How do you decide when when a piece is right for you? It's the hardest question. There is never any way for me, at least, to know I'm not doing a mistake, you know. And I, I spend quite a lot of time thinking about my new project, my new programs, because I perform one or two or three programs and I mix them up for a season or a season and a half. So it's not that I'm changing that often. So I have time to think about the next project. And I, I just, I know what I like and I, what is important to me is like, it, it really says something coherent. It's not just a succession of pieces that have no story or no link in between. I want to say something. It can be a link through time, through uh, composers, through a certain theme, whatever, but it needs to have, to, to, to be a whole thing in itself. So it's a, it's a challenge. It's not easy. Have you ever picked a piece and fallen out of love with it? No, not yet. Okay. So no, no mistakes, big mistakes. No big mistakes. And over time, are there composers that, let's say, 10 years ago, you didn't connect with, but now you're seeing things, hearing things in that music that you didn't before? I think there is composer that I haven't played yet. And those are growing on me for sure. I'm thinking about Schubert, for example. Uh, but I, it's not that I don't, I, I didn't hear what I hear now. I hear more now, but it's just that I'm, I'm growing with it. I'm growing with the composers and I, I am more uh, sensitive to, I hope to what they, they, they want to say. So I'm growing as an artist, but there's no big changes about what I perceived and what I perceive now. What do you miss the most about live performing? Or live audiences, I should say. This magic feeling when suddenly you feel like it can be 50 people, it can be 200 people, it can be 2,000 people, it can be even 15,000. Uh, this one moment when you feel, you have the feeling that everybody is breathing at the same time and together with the music and that you will hear the tiniest noise, you know, uh, because everybody is there. And that's something, even with the best social media, with the best recording is totally irreplicable. Mm. And the next time you'll be in front of an audience you think is August at the Chamber Festival in Germany? Exactly. Well, I'm so glad you have that. I've certainly, as I yeah. Artists, they all have a date, a concert, something in the future that will be the first time. Some people have already done it. You know, they found one way or another to play in front of people. But most people, yeah. that date's still ahead of them. Um, is there a piece that you're playing then that you're very excited about? I'm playing many things, different things. And uh, there is a little bit of the Beethoven year celebration still going on. So I'm going to perform some Beethoven sonatas that I really adore. And uh, playing lots of chamber music as it's a chamber music festival. And I'm mostly excited to, to be again with some colleagues and friends and to, to play music together, actually. Well, that's great. We'll wrap up in just a second. I want to thank people for joining us today. This is Lise de, Sol, de, Lise de la Salle, wonderful pianist who joined the YCA roster in 2004. And she very much represents the kind of artist that we're trying to find and support. You know, that she went from our roster to Frank Solomon and plays all over the world and records and plays with the best orchestras. Um, I want to remind people that during this time of no concerts, we have something called the Keep Our Artists Working Fund, and we're raising money to give project money to artists to help them do things in this time without concerts. So we welcome your support. We invite you to look at our website, www.yca.org to learn more. Um, Lise, where can people find you online? Where can they hear your recordings? Where can they follow your career? 
So I have a website. It's www.nistelassalle.com. Uh, I two years ago now I quit uh, all social media because I didn't really uh, find myself in these things. Uh, of course, with the confinement to have a support, a digital support, I went back on Facebook with my confinement life. And in the meantime, I started, uh, I mean, two years ago, a blog, which is uh, to be found on my website. You have the blog button. And that's, uh, of course, during the confinement, I was mostly doing the, the live on Facebook. So I stopped a little bit, but I will go back. Uh, lots of people are asking for me to go back. So I will go back to my blog. And this is really a place where I share with my audience whatever I want. It can be literature, it can be dance, it can be just thoughts, it can be, uh, I'm feeling, it's not marketing or publicity related to my concerts, that's what I mean. It's just about my life as an artist and as myself. So that's where people can follow me. And if they want to hear me on Spotify, it's the, the right place. That's fantastic. And the recording you're making coming up, remind me the name again, the dance. The piece Shall we? How we dance. So maybe in about a year, we should be looking for that? Does it take a year? Spring 21 is supposed to be the release date. I don't have the official date yet, but April, May, probably around that time. Well, we wish you all the best in recording <laughs> that. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Good luck with everything and good luck to all the YCA new artists and candidates and give it all. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Thanks for talking with us. Thank you.